Simon, can you hear me? I cannot hear you. If you can hear me, I cannot hey. hear you. Okay, I heard you for a second. Okay. Hang on. Boom, now I got you. Oh, cool. Can Hang you hear on. me? I can. Man. Oh, look it... at that surfboard. What? How about that? <laughs> <laughs> does that look familiar? Uh, yeah, it certainly does. Shit. Have hey, you made... I've been really well, man. This has been such a long time coming. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, was a, I was a little bit tricky to um, tie down there. It seems like every, you know what it's like, every week vanishes in a day, you know? Dude, this entire, since quarantine hit, it's uh, time is kind of warped in a way that I've never experienced before where at once it's gone by in a flash, but at the same time, I feel like, it's been, you know, we've been in quarantine for years at this point. Yeah, yeah, totally. I totally get it. Um, wow. What's um, the, is it been relatively cool where you guys are, or has it been flaring up? Or it's crazy. Uh, our life, it has. It's been totally cool, actually. Um, I hate to even say that because I know that other people have suffered through it. So I'm always apprehensive to kind of talk about how much our life has yeah. improved yeah. during quarantine. But honestly, our life's improved. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like uh, I guess now in the last month or two, the beaches are more crowded. But when we were actually in lockdown. I was still surfing. It was uncrowded. There's no traffic on the freeways. We had access to all the food and things that we needed. And um, the surf industry only kind of thrived through it really strangely. And we got to spend more time at home. Since we've been home, we're eating way better than we ever used to and spending yeah, way less that, money. Yeah. You know? So let's hope that that is a reset for... I think that the industrialization of the whole food industry is something that's really come into focus. And mm -hmm. if you can get better quality food closer to home and quite often not pay any more for it, you know, than something that's been shipped in, but it's, um, uh, you know, I, I hope a lot of these changes resonate with more people, you know, and I'm sure they will. Um, it's uh, something that we've just, I guess, got to hope that we can hang on to. And, um, are you particular about your diet? Do you avoid certain things? Um, pretty much I'll eat everything. Um, I, um, um, I don't tend to lock up, like I eat grains, I'll eat a little bit of red meat, I eat a lot of seafood, um, heaps of fresh veggies. Um, and so in saying that, you know, broad overview, I eat pretty much everything, uh, dairy as well. Um, but I'm always, we've, um, we've got some really good um, uh, organic milk and cheese and things like that and yogurt and, um, and we've had actually both our kids have gone through a Steiner education. So I have a, um, uh, through Bessie, my partner, my wife, we've had um, a kind of a long held interest that was fostered by her in um, biodynamic farming. And there's a lot of uh, that, you know, all over the world anyway, there's a lot of interest in it, but there's particularly, a, uh, this is quite a hotspot for that sort of, um, sort of land management and farming practices. Mm. Um, so, yeah, look, I've always enjoyed eating everything. The one thing I would say is that I'm more cautious of red meat now. Um, I still eat a little bit of it, for sure. But, um, and I've never been big on it, but, um, you know, a small portion here and there is good, yeah. What, uh, what are you cautious about? when it comes to red meat? Um, the fact that it tends to go through, um, 
I don't want to provide you with too much information, David. But the uh, podcast, can, the uh, podcast is great for lots of information. This is the right platform. Yeah, so go deep. Yeah. I've, I, if I eat meat, I do the smelliest shit <laughs> and they always come away. <laughs> and I, I go, man, that is so wrong. You know, it's, um, anyway, I told you it was a lot of information coming through there, but. But your body, so, yeah. will, your body will tell you. That's a super important detail is that your body will absolutely tell you what benefits it and what doesn't. And so that's a pretty strong sign that it didn't like red meat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also too, I had, um, I had back in my 30s, actually, I had my gallbladder removed. And I've heard that that's a bit of a, um, a um, that can be an issue with, with digesting fats. Um, because the bile helps your your um, helps you digest the the fats or metabolize the fats, digest them, then metabolize them more. So, I think um, I'm actually just kind of you know it hangs in there for a while and rots a bit, and then I um, yeah I expel it. So, you know. Yeah, well, that's beans a problem. And rice, oh my god, I can eat tons of beans and rice, and uh, I love millet and as a grain millet with strawberries and honey and yogurt oh for breakfast yeah oh my god that's what is Um, what does the steiner school have to say about alcohol steiner's interesting in the fact that he um broadly has this take on you don't have to believe me i don't i'm not expecting you to follow me here or to adopt this or anything just give it some thought so i'm sure he's his um approach to alcohol would have been just just give this some thought you know don't just take it as it is and consume it or not consume it whatever it is just really give it some deep thought and um look i'm not i've always enjoyed a beer nowadays um especially in the last year i'm like really not much at all Mm. at all Um, I think I had a little glass of red last night. During the week, I don't tend to at all. Um, and part of the motivation there was actually, um, we were at a show, a mate show, um, and it was, uh, we were playing one of Torrance movies actually, this really great pub up in the hills. And it was, um, and the band, one of the bands that is uh, involved in the music for, a lot of the Need Essentials films is a band called Headland and they're all good mates. And um, anyway, we were at this pub and it was the, the 22nd of March. I remember it distinctly and it was just as COVID was really starting to sort of rear its head as a thing. Anyway, we were all up there and, um, and it's away in the hills, this pub. It's kind of like something, it reminds me to look at actually this pub of something out of the US. It's got this rickety old train line and there's, you can sort of see in your mind's eye tumbleweeds blowing down the street and stuff. And uh, it was a particularly raucous occasion. And I remember walking away from it going, that's not a sustainable thing, you know. Um, and giving it some thought later was like, I love my surfing so much that I was like, okay, remove anything from your life that's going to impede you surfing for as long as possible. So, um, and of course the first one was alcohol, you know, like remove that one. That's a no brainer. Um, and I feel so much better without it. That's funny. The other day I had two drinks, woke up the next day actually feeling it. And I was like, wow, that was only two. (laughs) Mm. So um, I'm um, uh, much better without it, yeah. And I don't miss it, to be honest. I'm glad to hear that. I've heard that from a lot of people, to be honest. Um, There's a real diminishing returns on it. So when you're in your 20s, it can increase the fun. And the deficit the next day isn't so detrimental. And that everything after that, the returns just get diminished on. It just, it's less and less fun and the recovery time is increased. And you get to a yeah. point where it's, you're only doing it out of 
habit. You know, you're just used to drinking whatever it is, wine with dinner or beer or whatever. And years go by and you're like, I don't even know why I'm doing this anymore. The, uh, the social norms just reinforce that, you know, and, and I sort of look at, I've spoken with Bessie about this and, and we look at it and you go, it's almost like watching somebody light up a cigarette nowadays to me. I'll see it. Really? It's like this, this glitzy kind of labeled beer bottle. And it's like, that's kind of like the old days of cigarettes, you know, you are really being sold this thing, you know, it's been pushed. Um, yeah. And I, um, I reckon in the future, it's a little bit like, you know, one of those old weird social norms, which, you know, smoking once was, you know, although mm-hmm. I thankfully never got involved in cigarettes, but, um, it was, um, I kind of could see it evolving that way, you know. And funnily enough, a lot of the young people around here um, aren't really that interested in it, to be honest. Good. Uh, Not at all like um, decades gone by. Yeah. Hopefully hopefully the young ones are, uh, hopefully humanity is evolving and uh, we can get on without that one, you know. I was glad to hear you say that the reason why you've stopped drinking a little bit is because uh, you want to continue to surf. And I think that's key. That's why I was asking you about food too. It wasn't just Mm. to make conversation. It's, I wanted to hear how you maintain a high level of surfing into your later years, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, look, I'm I'm 56 and I think the, um, you know, you can kind of waddle up into your late thirties and early forties, still feeling pretty robust. Um, and then all of a sudden you're in your late forties, moving into your fifties and you really do start to feel your, um, your energy levels sort of fall away for sure. I, um, I can't do the hours and hours and hours I used to. Um, working that is and even surfing too you know like I'll tend to get a lot more out of a um, out of a shorter surf than a really long one Um, now you can go for those it's funny actually if you if you have a busy day and you um, you're like oh man I really need to go in the water Uh, quite often I'll just go and limit myself to three waves and uh Quite often those surfs are some of the best ones you ever have. You've got three chances Mm. and uh, then you're back on land and you're kind of back into what you, you know, actually need to be, you know, doing whatever that is. Um, So, but getting back to the energy levels and the, and the, um, your physical, your physicality is um, you definitely become more, more high maintenance, you know, uh, yeah, got to have exactly. a good, uh, relationship going with a, uh, an osteopath that I have. Um, and I always find myself rubbing up against poles and things like, you know, like dogs do. They're kind of grinding up against things and sort of uh, self-maintenance and stretching and that sort of thing. But um, And particularly when you're doing repetitive activities like shaping is... Um, you quickly can create imbalances that uh, you need to be aware of. And actually there's a, um, I had a, um, I had a shoulder issue there for a while. It was fine. I was still doing everything, but it was really quite painful. And um, uh, anyway, I was seeing my osteopath about it and things like that. And it's, and I also did some Feldenkrais, which is a pretty amazing um, philosophy as well and uh, it's just about remembering or using all of the uh, appropriate muscle groups for certain activities and um, yeah it was as simple as reusing the larger muscles in my back to do certain activities where I was starting to use all of the smaller muscles in the top of my shoulder and uh I was like, for a little while there, I was like, oh my God, this is actually impeding my paddling. This is Mm. terrible. You know, like, um, 
this cannot go on, you know? So uh, anyway, that was, um, that's a really good thing for older guys to, or anyone actually to remember is to really engage those larger muscles in your back around your scapula for a lot of those activities like paddling and, um, and shaping and doing anything, you know, with your arms. Um, I see it now when I see people using the muscles on tops of their shoulders and I can spot it now and I'm almost like, Oh, stop. You know, but of course I don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's good That's info. Cool. It's funny. You're talking about how to um, maintain surfing. I feel like the other, it's increasingly important the older that you get to like surfing, continuing surfing probably keeps you in better health in all those other ways, physically and spiritually. So doing the maintenance oh. on land, is hyper important yeah. because the surfing is going to be the thing that restores you once you're back on land, you know? Exactly. Yeah. That's so true. Like those three waves I was telling you about, yeah. you know, you can have a booked out day of different things to do, but if you can slot just three waves in that whole day is just, it's so well lubricated, you know, it's, um, uh, and it's, you know, I'm privileged to be able to do that, you know, and, and I totally get that. But uh, I, um, as far as a, a mood thing and just socially too, you know, it's so important to have other people out there in the world that you really deeply connect with and mm -hmm. um, nothing better than a, than a good, strong surfing community to, uh, um, you know, lubricate the social the social wheels in your life and um, that's the other fantastic thing about surfing is just how it is crosses so many age groups you know you you can be paddling back you know to the top of the point with a 13 year old and a 75 year old and you're 56 and you're all throbbing on the same thing it's like it's it's just got to be one of the most uh, incredible things, you know? Yeah. Uh, that well, way. Yeah. you talked about, um, the band, is it headlands? Yeah. Headland. Headland. Yeah. Um, yeah. speaking of community, I was going to say your guys little collective between the band, the shaper, the wetsuit brand yeah. and the surfer and the director is yeah. um such a powerful little group that works so well together creatively we'll get into kind of each of those details but let's start with how did you connect with Torin? you're sort of always aware of people around you in a, in a community Torin was sort of one of those um uh, I remember seeing him at board riders things, not that I was ever big on board riders, but I'd be there with Dash or something and he'd be aware of Tyron and he was writing lots of short books in that period. And, um, he had a, um, uh, Tyron's tall and angular and looks, moves beautifully through the, you know, through the world. And, uh, you know, we all notice those things, you know, when, you know, something attracts your eye. Um, and anyway, so I was always aware of him. And then Tracksmag were doing some projects up here and they had, um, they had a house on the beach, you know, getting a bunch of us to shape boards for this. They were going to have like some kind of little camp out thing at this house and just surf and, Oh, that's right. They got artists in and all this sort of thing and um, made a little film about it. And it was just about this week in this beach house. And I uh, first met Tyron there and um, I'd shaped, they wanted kind of something, they wanted obscure things for this shoot. And I'd shaped a, um, an asymmetric single fin and uh I had Tyron in mind. I was like, yeah, it'd be really cool to see him because he's tall and angular and that sort of thing. You know, I think the first day I ever met him, this is, I can't remember how many years ago this is now, maybe oh, seven, seven years ago or something. 
Um, and anyway, I picked him up and we were, we drove down to the point and, and Tyron rode this single fin and incidentally, he never really gels with single fins, but I saw him do a few turns on that particular day at Lennox and uh, he did a couple of these real 12 o'clock re-entries on this single fin and uh, it just looked so spectacular. It was like, wow, you know, the, the body matched the board, matched the wave. Uh, it was, and there was a certain smoothness to it. And um, anyway, I was like really impressed, you know, I was like, oh, wow. And then exactly where it went from there but I made him another couple of boards wherever they were and uh, he took one to Desert Point and anyway then he came home with um, he came home with that board and we ended up putting uh, some plugs in it so that he could ride it as, as a single fin and, uh, and then he went back to Bali and had Anyway, this board ended up becoming the only board that he rode on that trip or whatever. It was just one of those boards that really kind of clicked and, um, and it sort of rolled on from there that um, the single fin that we turned into a twin fin, you know, so, um, and there is so many similarities to single fins and twin fins, uh, which is why straight away that was always going to work anyway. It's, um, he, um, yeah, he really got attached to that board and we just started tinkering from there, you know, and oh man, we've bounced around so many different ideas with twin fins. He's, he's really, um, um, uh, look, it, it, was a, it was a strange thing to watch him go from being a shortboard guy to a, to a ride all lengths twin fin guy, you know, there was, um, there was one stage there where I, I remember looking back on it, thinking, imagine telling Tyron a year ago that one of his favorite boards would be a um, seven, six plus. He would have just yeah. looked at you and gone, you're kidding me, no way, you know? Because everything was sort of around, you know, six foot would have been pretty long. So why do you think that he was open to transitioning off of the high performance thrusters? I think that um, it's in Torrens' nature to look at the world with really open eyes. He's unafraid to be different. Um, unaf um, maybe that's saying it wrong. He's, he's um, yeah, he's just really happy being himself. And the more he's himself, which he clearly is all of the time, uh, the, the, the more kind of blown away I am by watching him go through the, through time, you know, he's, um, he's a, a really, you know, unique human and he's grown up around a lot of really unique humans like, you know, Ishka, who's Torrance filmmaker, you know, he's, he's, they've spent a lot of time together, those guys under some really extreme conditions and uh and they're both incredible people who are really calm and and prepared to take the world as it is and and never um afraid by difference or um obscurity or anything like that everyone uh, you can watch by Tyron's manner in the in the water you know Tyron is um never he's never one of those hustlers in the water and uh and in turn it's almost like the world just goes oh this guy over here he's been so cool he's the best way of the day you know it's right. um yeah it's uncanny and he um yeah he's he's just very open to all things which is why he was totally out, you know like some of the first boards i gave him was so out of left field from me shortboarding but you know he happily took them and came back and goes oh yeah not so much this one you know whatever it was like um 
he was um, yeah, just very open-minded, yeah. I was surprised to hear you say there's a lot of similarities between single fins and twin fins. Can you explain what those similarities are? Because I don't, I don't see them right off the bat. Um, the, the rockers um, and the, the way the foam is distributed through the board um, are the two key things. Um, typically, the, the rockers are flatter. Um, and I find it, um, when you look at a, if you look at a, uh, it, it, it also depends on the, the era of single fin that you're looking at too. Um, but if you go sort of closer towards the end of the seventies and you see how evenly the foam is distributed throughout the board, um, that's a really key ingredient for a good twin fin as well. Um, I think those, I think twin fins, or I, I think all boards, I'm getting myself a bit tangled here, but I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of modern shortboard and I'm thinking of single fins and twin, fin, twin fins, two totally different things and all as viable as each other. But I think the, the one thing that I've always found uh, with singles and twins is that by distributing the foam more evenly throughout the board, you create a bigger sweet spot and that makes life so much easier for so many people. Uh, especially if you are just trying to blast out there and catch those three waves that I was talking about, you don't want to go out there and have to, absolutely make sure your back foot lands in that spot and your front foot's in that spot. Otherwise, this board isn't going to go. You want to, you want to glide into a wave, skip to your feet and away you go, you know. Um, so that, that's that thing about sweet spot, you know. It's so important to have, have a larger sweet spot rather than a tiny sweet spot, you know. So um, it also opens up the individuality in a person surfing too, you know, you can, you can suddenly surf how you surf. I remember, um, I remember growing up and you could always spot whoever it was on a wave from a long way away. You could go, oh, there's blah, 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 you know, and it was just the way they surfed, you know, and everyone had their own kind of groove going on. Even like the early days of the ASP and all that sort of thing, you know, you had, Reno Abelira, Simon Anderson, you know, all of these different characters, all surfing so differently on all this different equipment. It was, um, but anyway, as the boards got more and more tightened up, you end up controlling the stance and style of the surfer to a certain extent, because um, you have to conform to that, that really precise design. Yeah. Um, which is equally great. You know, I'm not running that down at all. You know, that's yeah. fantastic what's been achieved. But it's interesting to think of all of that through the lens of Torin because if he had continued riding those high performance shortboards, I don't really know that we would be able to differentiate him now from everybody, all the other pros that were doing kind of that picked that path. But by yeah. virtue of him getting on your boards, it, he's appealed to a much kind of, uh, he's opened all of our eyes to this alternative equipment that actually suits us so much better. And even though I'll never surf like Torin, when I watch Torin, it's a lot more relatable than when I watch Felipe Toledo or Idolo Ferreira, Absolutely. you know? Yeah. And then also you're talking about the sweet spot on the board, the one board that I have from you, that's true for but there's also a much broader sweet spot in the variety of waves that I can ride it in. Whereas yeah. the high performance shortboard, I'm only gonna take out on a certain type of really good waves, essentially. That yeah. board, I've ridden it in one foot surf and had a blast and I've ridden in head high point break surf and it's equally as uh, applicable in both conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially too, if you get some, um, if you have a, um, uh, don't get me wrong here, I'm not sort of advocating that, you know, 
alternative boards are the be all and end all or whatever. But there's also another thing. I'm kind of going to go back to those three waves again, right? I don't know why I hadn't planned on this. But if you jump in for a surf, it's low tide, there's a ton of current, and you've got to try and get these three waves, the last thing you want to be is, is really exhausted. So it's also really important to not confine yourself to having minimal amounts of foam at all times either. You know, if you can jump in in something that's actually a good paddling machine as well, uh, you're not going to be exhausted when that situation arises. Here's the wave, I'm the guy, and you're not huffing and puffing. Um, you can just skip to your feet because it's all been a little bit easier. I mean, that's such a, you know, isn't that what it, it's kind of to me, that's what it's all about is sort of maximizing the fun. And I, I know that's not anything revolutionary. That's what we're all trying to do. But um, it's uh, the, as you were saying, a board that can be ridden in one foot waves and also be ridden in overhead waves uh, and kind of equally applies itself to both conditions. It's, um, um, surely that's easier than, yeah, kind of confining yourself to something that's awkward yeah. sometimes and then perfect the other times. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell me um, what your association is with the film Morning of the Earth? How did it, how did it come to be that your surfboard label is Morning of the Earth? Ah, oh, well, this is a long story. Um, how can I make it? How can I edit this one down? Um, on my 21st birthday, Bessie, my wife, who I've spoken of just before, she handed me this crusty old album, Morning of the Earth, and it was secondhand out of a collector's shop. It had rare copy written on it. And I was like, oh, yeah, cool. Well, I opened up the, the album. There's that famous picture of MPs cut back. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah. And we're like, well, I put the music on, you know, and it was like 21. Anyway, thinking back to the music we were listening to at those times, it was um, totally different to that. Anyway, we put Morning of the Earth on and it was like, oh, my God, listen to this music. This is so wild, you know. Uh, and we were living at that time with a good friend of ours, Ben Brown, an artist and we um, ended up getting the film and it just su struck such a chord. It was just like, wow, this is insane. Like, look at all the different boards. And it was made in a, in a part of the country that I've always dearly loved. And it was just, it was just the most um, incredible thing to watch and listen to that album and watch the film. And, um, Anyway, it really resonated with me. And I remember thinking at the time, that is, um, that's such a good idea for a surfboard label, right? And anyway, I parked that in the back of my mind and, you know, life goes on, da, 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 da. And um, then about, it would have been like 10 years later, um, I'm trying to get the, timing right in my brain anyway it was the um, early 90s and there was the the influx of imported goods was really starting to ramp up and you know there's murmurings of surfboards were going to be made offshore and all this sort of thing and then that started to happen and it was um a um yeah, quite a disruptive time in, in the surfboard industry. It was here anyway. It was um, um, particularly sort of fraught because a, a lot of surfboard manufacturers aren't particularly good business people, including myself, um, who have the, um, at the time, had the, uh, the thought process that we were going to compete with China and all that sort of thing. And it was like, hang on. <laughs> This is not going to work, you know. Uh, and anyway, at that time, I remember thinking I have to 
I can't keep going like this because at the time I was doing a lot of sanding and laminating and stuff like that, just trying to bring up a young family and grabbing any work that was around me at all just to pay bills and things like that. And it just seemed to be increasingly hard to stitch it all together. And people were actually leaving the industry at that point because it was getting so sort of tricky and a lot of work was going overseas. Um, you know, mainly things like Minimals and that sort of fun board kind of thing at the time. And um, anyway, I was sitting out the back of the factory there down in Byron here at the Bear and the Takayama factory where I was working. And a good friend of mine, um, Paul Hutchinson, um, who still shapes down there, uh, we were sitting out the back and we were talking about, you know, what was going on and, you know, blah, blah, blah about the industry and that sort of thing. And I said, look, I've had this idea for a number of years. Um, morning via surfboards, you know, and I was like, it's such a classic idea. And I said, Paul, you should do it, right? And the reason why I said, Paul, you should do it is that he actually shaped Steve Cooney's board in Morning of the Earth, the one that he rides at Uluwatu. And, um, and he's in the film too. He's the one, he's carrying a blue board in the Uluwatu scenes. And I was like, this is such a good idea. You should do it, Paul. And he goes, no, nah, I don't want to do it. You do it. And I'm like, look, I'll give you a week. If you don't, if you don't want to do it in a week, I will do it. You know? So anyway, a week goes by and I go, okay, I'm going to do it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I said, so where's Albie? You know, you must know where Albie is. And he goes, yeah, he's down around Scott's head somewhere, you know, like that. I'm like, okay. And it was back in the days of phone books. I flip open the phone book and I'm going down, I go, a thousand there he is no way i rang him cold call <laughs> and i said hi alby blah 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 you know i've had this idea for a decade i really want to do it and he's like oh yeah um let me think about it you know and i said yeah sure i'll ring you at the end of the week right and uh god knows what he thought but anyway i could, i was busting with anticipation i was like i couldn't um couldn't wait the week out i rang him back a couple of days later and i go what do you reckon you know and he goes yeah it sounds like a cool idea but yeah go for it you know and um that was the beginning of morning the earth surfboards i got some decals printed up and and the reason why i chose morning of the earth was why I felt so strongly about that idea was to me, it represented the beauty of surfing and just the, the real deep value of it. You know, it's like morning of the earth. The film is like, it's almost like public property, you know, here in Australia, it is anyway, it's just this, it just evokes feelings in people that are just, so important to us all and they mean so much and they talk to a period in surfing that's not worth forgetting you know a spirit a lifestyle a uh, it just speaks to so many things and that's why i thought it was a, a super cool and important uh reason to use it as a surfboard label because it evokes all of that beauty and and all of those important values that are built around surfing, you know, it was, um, yeah, yeah. So did, that did was Al how that happened. No, did Albie know who you were and did you have to pitch anything to him in terms of like the style of boards that you're going to be building? And why did he entrust you to be the one to do it? Um, essentially, Essentially, it was all done on a, not even a handshake. It was just like, um, here's my idea. It's going to be single fins and twin fins. And the other important thing that I said too was, it's never going to be a sellout. I'm never going to have like 20 boards in every surf shop all around the world or whatever. It's going to be like, I'll look after this, you know, like, trust me. I'll do the best I can possibly do with this, you know. Uh, and I think Albie is kind of 
in a, in a lot of ways very similar to Torrin and very trusting and open and was like, yeah, I haven't kind of heard of this idea before and this kind of sounds cool and like, you know, I think he could just hear how kind of passionate I was about the idea. And I was equally passionate then as I am now about it, you know. I was like, you know, you can trust me on this. And and the only reason he had any connection to me was via Paul, um, Paul Hutchinson. And I did actually make some boards and take them down and show him and say, this is the kind of thing I want to do so that he could see it wasn't some, you know, haphazard little, you know, screwball affair. It was actually legit. And uh, I made a couple of boards and took them down there and Bessie made a banana cake and we rocked up and drank tea, ate a banana cake and looked at these boards and, and that was kind of it. Yeah. And that was, um, you know, like 25 years. And right at that period, it was um, a lot of people, um, <laughs> a lot of people would question me and go, what the hell do you want to do that for? Why do you want to make single fins and twin fins? It was all white thrusters. Yeah. That was the only thing anyway, white thrusters and mini mouse. You know, that was it. Um, so it was quite fun to get the, <laughs> The reactions that I did at the time where it was like, what do you want to do that for? <laughs> well, anyway. uh, does, um, is Albie happy with what you've done with the brand? Oh, oh absolutely. I, I'm sure he is. Yeah. Good. We speak regularly, you know, Albie rides the boards and, and like I said to him in the beginning, you know, surfboards, it's never going to make us, you know monetarily wealthy or anything but you know it'll be a really great thing to do and um i think he's he's enormously happy with the outcome he actually said to me oh this is probably going back about a year or so um we were having this kind of deeper conversation about the boards and and what had happened and you know Torrin and ishka and the movies and all this sort of thing and and Albie's, um, Albie's uh, you know, a really deep thinker and things. And, and he, um, he said, oh, it's almost like a flower, you know, and it's, and it was like a little bud. And he goes, this is, it's like it's in full bloom at the moment, you know, it's like this thing is just opened up and it's just reached and touched so many people via the surfboards, you know. And it's, um, I have to say, it does amaze me, you know, the amount of people, the amount of young people, like teenagers and who are just so into Morning of the Earth. And that, of course, they've discovered it through the movie, but they've also discovered it via the board. So it's this, um, it's been this um, incredible thing of um, all of this momentum and, this perpetual kind of energy that it's kind of gained, you know, and, uh, and all carrying along the beauty and the goodwill of the original film, you know, which, um, which started with Albie talking to some nuns on the street in Sydney. Uh, and he, and, and they said to him, he got into a conversation with them and they said to him, well, what do you really want to do in life? You know, and Albie's like, however old he was, 20 something. And he just said, I want to make a really beautiful surfing film. And I'm like, wow, it's almost like you can trace it all back to that conversation with some nuns and Albie on the street in grimy old Sydney. And, uh, and here it is now and it's still just blooming and flicking off everywhere in all these different directions. It's, um, it's such an unreal thing. It is. And I don't, I'm not trying to blow my own horn. I just no, think it's no. such a wildest thing, you know, to think it's well, I think, created such. Honestly, I don't think that you're fully even aware of the influence of the boards that you're making for Torin. Here in Southern California, I've seen a lot of um, what I would, what I've always thought of as being high performance shortboard shapers now yeah. adding a mid length 
to their quiver of boards that they offer. And, um, but the funny thing is they've never actually seen one of your boards. And yeah. I had, tra I, I'm, you're probably familiar with the surfboard shaper, Travis Reynolds. Yes. Up yeah. in Santa Cruz. I saw him a month ago and he goes, he listens to the podcast sometimes. He goes, Hey, you have one of those morning of the earth boards, right? And I go, yeah. And he goes, I had a customer order. He wanted something similar to that. And yeah. so here's what I made for him. Does this look mm -hmm. similar to the one that you ride? And yeah, I, happen yeah. to, I happen to have some photos of my board on my phone. So I, I was like, well, the one that I have, there's a little bit of a beak on the nose and it's kind of wider up here. And he goes, well, where are the fins placed and how big are the fins? So then I'm showing him photos of that. <laughs> and, and ultimately of the ones that I've seen um, being made here in California, none of them actually get kind of the sweet spot of yours. They're, they're always veering more towards being more foiled and being more high performance. They seem to always want to reduce the volume mm -hmm. and yeah. maybe make them lighter and make them more yeah. high performance. Whereas I really feel like the key thing with this board here is the weight. There's like a swing weight in the front. And so yeah. there's a, there's a trim that it finds yeah. and like, um, I don't know what a tracking that it has that all of those boards wouldn't have because they're lighter. Yeah. Yeah. They definitely momentum in the craft is something that's so important. Um, that's it. Yeah. It's uh, not in all boards, of course, but it's, um, but getting back to that thing of like Travis and all of that sort of thing and, and, and how we got, there talking about him isn't that just the most unreal thing to think that that's actually what Travis did there it's actually a continuation of that idea from the nuns and Albie on the street you know it's crazy it is so wild yeah and and Christian Beamish actually he does some beautiful looking you know um channel around a pin twins and uh there was one that he did in a post and he said um it was one of the first ones he did and he goes um oh, something about he was giving credit to myself and tyron and he said and it's gone off like a wildfire all around the world and it's like wow that is that's the, the that's the um the incredible thing that really gets my my um just excites me so much to think that you know from that conversation on the street with the nuns that is just sparking off everywhere and all of this is because of morning of the earth it's insane i love it it, it really <laughs> is wild and i don't know that i could think of a, a kind of more impactful partnership between surfer and shaper I mean, with, competitively, you certainly have like Kelly and Al Merrick, John John and Paisel, and there's those things. But outside of competitive surfing, I feel like you guys have really um, such an impactful and influential partnership that, again, I don't know who else I can kind of put in that grouping and in, in the modern era anyways. Yeah, I oh, think you. Fire out, you know, like getting back to Torrens and nature, you know, it's... Um, you um, he, he's so open to your ideas and open to giving it a crack, whatever it is. And uh, the uh, when I gave him oh, the the first longer one that I ever did was a seven ten, and uh, yeah, I remember giving it to him. And it was just like, it was so out of the parameters that we'd been working in, you know, up to like six foot and stuff like that. And all of a sudden I'm handing him this enormous object, you know, and uh, he went away for a day or whatever. And he comes back to me and he was just so alive and stoked. Just like, oh my God, this thing has changed my life. You know, wow. I, I can remember those words. And uh, yeah, it was, um, it, it's certainly getting back to what you said about, you know, 
surfer shaper. I think it's just because he's just been so open mm. you know, and obviously has that, that openness brings, you know, an ease of character and, and physicality where he's just like, yeah, just open, open yourself to this experience and see what it's like. And you can see in his travels, you know, the way he opens himself to experience and, and the things that he gets back from it. Like I actually just watched um, the New Zealand Lost Track last night. And that is, um, you know, I look at Torrin and man, it's just so him, you know, he's not, he's never, you know, he's not trying to be anyone or anything. He is so solidly himself, you know, and, yeah. and that comes out so strongly in that film. Uh, yeah, it was such a blast watching it. Yeah, because it's, um, it's been a long time in the making, that one. Oh, yeah. I remember when they did that trip. Um, is there any other, but any other surfers that you'd like to see riding your boards? There's, oh, yeah. Look, there's. Um, I think I'd actually spoken to Torrin about this. I was like, imagine getting Steph Gilmore to ride one. Wouldn't that be cool, you know? And then it was so weird. About within, we just spoke of the idea, and then it was almost like in the same breath. I think it was Sam from Stab rang up and goes, oh, I can't remember who it was now, actually. But anyway, someone from Stab and they were like, oh, yeah, we've got this idea, you know, the electric acid thing. And um, anyway, long story short, Steph ends up writing one. It was like, oh, my God, that was what we wanted to see. And there we get to see it. You know, that was so fantastic. Um, and then uh, I look around and I see a lot of other surfers that were that another one that actually worked out in a similar vein is um uh i think i can say this now because i saw it in a in a post Jake Glinderman, yeah who's a young kid from lennox yep um and i man he is so freaking smooth um He's just such an insane surfer to watch. And as we all know, um, and I saw him in the swell before last, I pulled up down at the point and uh, I go, oh, there's Jai, you know, and I wave at Jai. And he gives me this kind of extra look like, oh my God, you know, like, hi. And he, he goes, wait. And he runs over to the car, flips the boot up and pulls out the, the Fiji that I made for that electric acid test that Steph wrote and he pulls that out and I go, no way. And, uh, and the point was corking that day. Anyway, I got to see Jai ride that board on about three waves. So I saw two or three waves. And um, so that was a real thrill to see that. But at the same time, a little bit cautious with, um, we, with guys who have their shortboard thing really, really down, it's like, oh, don't, don't kind of upset anything, you know, like you have a little go, but then get back on your shortboard because you're shredding, you know, don't, yeah, don't kind of ruin what you've got going on. So, well, uh, you didn't say it, but the listener, listeners should know that Stephanie picked your board as her favorite, basically the winning board from that electric acid surfboard test from Stab. So yeah. that, was a, that was a big deal. Yeah, that was so wild. That was such a, such a blast. I was like, yeah, that was a, a real, I have to say that was a real little highlight of my life, actually. Was it really? Um, yeah, yeah, because she's just, I mean, she's, to us here in Australia, I don't know, she's just like, um, I mean, I don't have to say, to let anyone know what an amazing woman she is, but, um, yeah, just what you couldn't have, oh, it just totally blew me away. I remember we were up at, um Corumban and we watched the premiere of it and um it was in that thing how they play it but then they don't tell you who won until a week later or something like that 
anyway, we're all milling around afterwards and um, she leans up close to me and she goes, you know, you won, don't you? And I was like immediately just so taken off, like caught off guard and just so blown out. Yeah. I can't even remember the next hour or so. I was just like totally stunned. Like, no way. It was, um, it was such a thrill and a blast. Yeah. And she's just such an incredible human being. You know, she's another one of those ones like Tyron or whatever, just happy to be herself and do a thing. And um, yeah, and just like, oh, it's just, well, I can't say enough about that. It was, um, it's incredible. I was really glad to see you win it. Um, and I really felt like it was the most successful version of the electric acid surfboard test that they've done, or even of stab in the dark because, um, uh-huh. because Stephanie is open to writing all of those different things. When they did it yeah. with Dane Reynolds, I felt like he was trying to force his will upon some of those boards like a couple of the designs were whole designs and he was trying to push them into turns and it just, uh, yeah. it wasn't the way that those boards were meant to be written. It yeah. made Dane look like he was bogging and it made the boards look bad. Whereas yeah. I felt like Stephanie, she'd get to her feet and let the board kind of find it's what it wanted yeah. to do. And then she'd yeah. go with the board. And I, I yeah. thought it was like, it was actually an educational experience just watching it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're right. She's the the type of person who is like Torrin, open to the world, and will go to the board rather than trying to get the board to come to her. You know. Um, right. Yeah, and I think that's probably. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot to be said about somebody's upbringing too. You know, if you've you've had that kind of. Um, parenting or community around you who sort of foster those those sort of thoughts you know it's um it's uh uh you know that it creates people like that you know right open openness and warmth and strength of character and and the ability to recognize that the world's not all about you you've got to go to it um is um is particularly important you know it's um it's funny actually it's just made me think of during this whole lockdown period there was something that i hadn't seen for decades was um really strong localism start rear its head and um you know we're quite close to the queensland border here and uh you know to the point where you know, people in our community have Queensland number plates because it's sort of a fluid exchange. Yeah. Um, and there was, um, uh, yeah, just this localism started to rear its head. And I'm like, man, I haven't seen this stuff since, you know, the 1970s and, the, you know, late 70s, uh, which is kind of when that was kind of really prevalent, all that sort of stuff. And, um Anyway, I was looking at, there was one particular day, anyway, we we were at the point, I was walking around the point and it was chockers. And there was a lot of people from Queensland had come down, as you would, to check it out. It was an incredible few days of surf. And uh, there was a lot of people from out of town and there was cameras up everywhere and it was really full on. There was a lot of people getting really cranky about it. And I was like, and I can kind of understand that too, but um, I I had this thought where I was like, you know why we're all here? It's because we all love this thing and love this place. Like, you know, isn't that enough? Like, it's not like everyone's in the surf. Half of us are on land watching. Half of us are in the water. You know, we've had this, you know, we're all here for the same thing. You know, yeah. it doesn't get any better than that. It's yeah. not like, um, and then, 
And on top of that, the other thought I had that kind of reinforced that was, is that, you know, we're a young nation like you guys. And, and the price that um, our occupation uh, that has cost the First Nations people of this, this country is that um, they have welcomed us like right from day one, we were shown where the water is, you know, where the food is, how to get to here to there and all that sort of thing. It was all done with open arms. Yeah. And then I was like, how can we be so ignorant that us blow-ins can suddenly start calling rank on who can be here and who can't? It just seemed like a final great insult, you know, to to the people who originally shared this place with us, you know? So I think, um, it's a great yeah. point. It's a great point. And that's kind of the ultimate irony and hypocrisy with localism is thinking that you're, you're the first one there that you have some ownership of the land or the waves. It's insane. Everybody's yeah. a blow in. Yeah. You turn around and all these houses are built on stolen land and you know, it was, uh, yeah, yeah. It was, it's a great insult in that sort of situation, especially in such a, you know, a beautiful location as the, as the coastlines of all of our countries, you know, it's right. just like, get over yourselves, you know. Um, We've been allowed to come here and share it. Yeah. I wanted to ask you in regards to the success of Torin and his films and Ish Ishka's uh, contributions there. And then also with the stab in, or the um, electric acid surfboard test, you winning that your business has, I would imagine you've got a lot of demand on you and you made that promise to Albi that you'll never sell out. I'm sure that you have opportunities to grow your business in ways that might diminish the quality of the work that you're doing. How has your business grown? What decisions have you had to make along the way? Do you have other people helping shape, laminate? The, the one thing that's super important to me is that it was always going to be with my eye watching everything that's been done. And I kind of sound like a little bit of a control freak there. I get that. <clears throat> I'm not. I'm just really, really passionate about how it is and how it turns out. And... I definitely could have scaled it right up. Like, you know, I could have, I could have suddenly rushed to a machine and, you know, sending files to Europe and all that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, you end up with stuff that does not look the way I would want it to look. It would not, um, you would have to, anyway, it's not what I want to do. I don't want it to become you know, the Europe arm of morning of the earth and the US arm of morning of the earth or whatever. Part of, part of the whole beauty of morning of the earth is, is that it does evoke that really true period of the early surfboard industry and things like that. And obviously I've got to make a living and, you know, one day, you know, I want to have enough money to not, kind of work all the time. So, you know, I need to make some money, but at the same time, I am really conscious of it being in human scale. And by human scale, um, if, you, if you look at the polar end of where I'm at and you look at a big corporation and there's, you know, there's people fucking each other over there and somebody's absconding with money there and, and and they're just these enormous things that get out of control. You know, they're, um, they're beyond human scale. Uh, and I can't say that about everyone, but um, I never want it to get to the point where I haven't, I haven't signed off on every board. Every board's gone through my hands and that's it. That's, that's exactly how it should be. And so to do that, um, everything happens shaping wise in this room <laughs> um, and 
I have, to be honest, had a real battle trying to keep up with it all. I've got people waiting far, far too long for boards. And I don't, and I don't like that at all because part of the stoke of getting a board is kind of getting it within a few months, not kind of waiting as long. I won't tell you how long some people have been waiting, but um, it's, um, uh, I have actually stopped doing a lot of the laminating myself because I am like getting back to um, fitness and surfing and things like that. I can't do everything. You know, I've got to have a bit of a life, you know. So um, so I'm getting some help with the laminating, which is really cool. And they're super stoked to get it and do really beautiful work. Um, and which gives me more time to focus on, you know, the development of what Tyron and I do together and what a few other people, you know, like the, pe the other people around us working on the shapes um, and at the same, and talking about the shapes, you know, like I haven't, it's not like I've, um, I could have very easily built a whole ton of files and be having everything cut and be rubbing off cut shapes. I could have easily done that quite a while ago. Um, I really didn't, I've always been a hand shaper and I see a real necessity in, um, in knowing how to use a planer and all of that sort of thing to come to a shape. And apart from that, it's a really, it's a really great experience, but I can't shape 10 boards a week from the blank and do that every, every week of the year. Just like, no way it can't be done. You know, if you, if you want to blow your shoulders out and never paddle again, that's a good way of doing it. Um, so I think the, um, the one thing that I have done is I get some profiles cut where it's just the, the rocker cut into them. Um, then I template them and put the rails in and things like that, which has been a really big help because I'm not absolutely throwing a planer around for every board. Um, and but the long story short is I don't want it to get too big uh, because otherwise you end up just managing something and you're not actually working in something. Yeah. You end up just, you know, pushing more zeros around and more bits of paper and, and that sort of thing. Um, and so it's really important that I'm, I'm really super hands on, you know, that's how I love it. You know, I love doing it, you know, that's the other thing. And as long as I love doing it, I want to be as involved as I possibly can. Um, and there's, and there's other, you know, we getting back to the, you know, other guy like Travis and when we were talking about other people doing things, it, it's the surfboard community is, is something that's got to open and flower as well, you know, and I love having some sort of influence in that when I go to the factory and there's younger guys and they're all peeking out about something, you know, it's this, it's a really juicy, creative environment to be in. And I want to be, you know, I'm one of the older guys in it now and I really want to be a really positive role model within that, you know, I don't want to be all, totally guarded about everything it's not like you can guard everything anyway you can't shape every board in the world and you can't make every board in the world so you know that gets back to the the two nuns in the street again you know talking to albie you know keep it as beautiful and as positive as you can you know like i've been incredibly fortunate um to even just get to where i am like you know i yeah. put my kids through school and you know i'm fit and healthy and everything's good and you know that's that's unreal you know and i'm not ignorant to the fact that one day i'm going to need to be, you know sit down and go oh <laughs> i'm fucked i can't work anymore or whatever hopefully i'll never get to that but you know i can't see myself stopping doing this to be honest yeah um as long as i'm fit and and surfing and stuff, I'll be shaping boards for sure. You know, I um, 
but you know human scale it's only ever going to get in my time as big as i can manage yeah you know, with the um, help of some people how often do you ride other shapers surfboards and or are there any other designs that you see out there that you're really curious about um uh how often do i shape do i ride shapers boards um when I see when I see a surfboard I like, they're quite often off in the distance, um, because I like to look at. The, I can see them from a distance. I'll go, "Whoa, what's that guy carrying?" You know, it'll um, it'll click. You know, occasionally you'll see something jutting out of the back of someone's car, but um, there's some some of the shapes that appeal to me. Um, uh, there's a couple of young guys from around here. There's um, um, Woody is one guy, young guy who shapes some really beautiful boards. There's a particular way of putting together an outline and some just totally flow and look good. Or maybe they remind me of my boards. I don't know what it is, but there's a certain, there's a certain kind of shape that, uh, really uh, clicks in your mind as being right, you know. Um, so, um, you know, I like Neil Purchase. I like some of his curves. Um, and problem is, I'm going to forget somebody here. I can feel it. <laughs> you know? There's going to be someone I'm like, oh, why didn't I say that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely people out there and I admire the work that they do, you know. And, and again, that's the, the beauty of surfboards is everyone brings their own particular thing to it. Sure, they can be influenced by something, which is what I've always done. That's how I got to where I'm at. I was, I was influenced by things. And you go off and do your thing and, yeah, amazing little industry like that. Um. What are you currently riding? I'm currently riding a 6.8 Fiji um, triple stringer. Um, and it's two and five eighths thick and it's 19 and three quarters wide. And uh, it's just a paddling demon. I love it. The way, um, and I can, I can move around the point Easily, it doesn't matter if it's current or whatever. Um, that's what I'm riding. It's got four deep channels in it, twin fin. Um, I feel really at home on that. And I've got a seven foot um, massive that actually doesn't have channels in it. It's got a concave bottom and a stinger, a soft stinger in it. And um, I made that because we're going off on a little tangent down that way. And so I've been riding that as well. Um, so I'm anywhere between six, eight and seven foot. They're the two boards that I've been riding mostly. Okay. I don't know if I've told you this or not, but when I got that board from you, I rode it for probably nine months straight, like exclusively. I wouldn't even put in a second board in my car. I just rode that all of the time. And the thing's kind of bulletproof, to be honest. Like there's no, there. I haven't dinged it yet. And there's hardly even any heel dents in the deck. Like oh. it's an old classic style of board building that's just sturdy. I am yeah. I really yeah. love the thing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Unreal. And, yeah. Which is... it, like the other thing is not only are there no visible dents, but the board still performs like it did when I got it, which so many other surfboards throughout my life, there's just, they're, they don't have the zing, you know, and the liveliness after mm. a month or two. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about three stringers keeping a board really stiff. Um, you don't have flex that's going soggy after a period. You've right. got this stiff object that maintains its rigidity over time. And so it does, it has that kind of everlasting feel. Yeah, I love it. Unreal. Thanks so awesome. much for all the work. Hey, I really appreciate your podcast and listen to it. Uh, it's, a, it's a great thing that you're doing, you know, like uh, this, um, the big 
surfing family, you know, and you're out there doing your bit and it's, um, it's very much appreciated. And I know, I know lots of people who listen to it. And they Thank, thanks for saying that. It's been really yeah. gratifying and fulfilling to do it. So I appreciate you saying that. Unreal. Yeah. Excellent work. Thanks. Well, thanks again for taking well, the time. In, uh, yeah, no worries. I'll give you, um, I learned you were the other day, Banyara. I'm pretty sure I got that right. And it's in good health in, um, in the Arakwal dialect from this area. Beautiful. Well, thank you for that. Cool. All right, David. All right. Have oh, a good day. You're welcome. Thank you so much. For All right. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, you too, man. All right. Yeah.